there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 267, 266, 267. I think it's 267. It should be. Dos says, or de says, de on the trois, quatre, cinq, six. I don't know. One of them questions. I don't know the numbers in Spanish anymore. I don't know. Welcome back to the show. It's me, your boy, Agostino Zinger, live and direct from somewhere from East London. It's early in the morning. It's Wednesday. How you doing? How you doing? You good? Great. Amazing to hear. It's Wednesday, man. For you weak-minded, you know, lacking in self-discipline MFers, it's the middle of the week now. You've only got a couple of days left until you can get on it like Sonic on that Friday night after work because that's all you guys live for, isn't it? You just live for Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. But not Maybe not Sundays because you dread waking up in the morning, but you only live for that Friday and Saturday. I'm glad. I'm glad every single day that I'm able to wake up, open my little black little dot of eyes and see the world for what it is all right the sun is beaming the sun the sun yeah the sun maybe the sun is beaming from this side of my window i'm staring directly into this camera 720p if you're listening via the podcast app what are you doing check me out on youtube if you're watching via youtube smash that like button hit subscribe and let me know what you think of the show all right cool damn we're in it okay so welcome back man as you can tell i'm really hyped i'm really fresh ready to go you know been intermittent fasting really well zero app has been helping me so much over the last few weeks i've been running a bunch doing push-ups lifting heavy weights over my head you know just absolutely getting it in not resting one iota until i get to a level that i want to be at what are you guys doing huh what are you doing exactly nothing <laughs> i'm only joking anyway i hope you guys are good I hope you guys are well it's wednesday i'm looking forward to it it's probably my most dreaded day today because my night are playing later on this evening um against tottenham and you know i'm nervous i'm scared because I'm aware that we're probably going to get battered and it's going to be a whole evening spent watching fan reaction channels making me more angry and then I end up, you know, not falling asleep. That's the thing that happens with fan reaction channels, you know. These fan reaction channels are the best thing to happen to football because I love how um, I love how annoyed the football journalists are getting with fan channels, you know. It's really putting them out. It's really kind of, you know, bending their nose the opposite direction because we've, we've had to put up with so much drosh in terms of journalists and editorial content when it comes to football. Right for the most for the for the majority of my um, uh, footballing loving life, I've had to spend my time listening to stuff like Talksport and reading, you know, tabloid newspapers like The Mirror, The Sun at times, The Time, whatever it may be. These cut fucking garbage newspapers and having to absorb any kind of knowledge or having to read between the lines where some of these journalists have their own motives, you know, um, enacted with some of their opinions. At least with the fan reaction channels, they can be a bit knee jerk. They can be a bit reactionary. Q is in a name, but at least you're getting direct, um, unfiltered opinions from people that actually love the club that you support. Or in some cases, you're getting some general football channels, like I think Football Daily and love a few other them, a few others are like that, even a squawker channel, which are you know generally give a platform for fans to come on and discuss their team in a clear and logical way. Biases are on the table because you know what team they support based on the jersey that they wear and how they shout on the camera. But by and large, it's fans, it's made for fans by fans. I love it. But you can't help but, you know, we have to admit, once your team loses and you watch a few of those channels and you have to go to bed, I find it so hard to go to sleep. Your mind is racing with all kind of opinions that you say if you're on the camera and points that you don't agree with. It just gets you riled up. It's probably the worst thing to watch going to sleep, maybe next to maybe a horror movie, right? It's just not the best thing. It's not going to, you know, send you to Betty Bye Bye time. It's just going to make you so irate. You wake up in the morning wanting to punch your wife. I, I mean, sorry, punch a wall, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what can you do? That is um for another day. I've already made a little com. I made, I made a little video actually regarding that, and it'll be available on my other podcast called Stratford Red Devils. If you haven't subscribed already, please check that out. Stratford Red Devils. I'll put the link below in the description because you subscribe to it. Um, it's it's a playlist on my YouTube channel. So if you're watching via YouTube, just click the link below. There'll be a link to my playlist of my United videos. I put them separately because you know this podcast I like to keep it separate, keep it nice and um specific to streetwear specific to culture specific to music and all that good stuff and then leave with the other stuff the other way so if you want to check out my views regarding football and regarding all things manchester united please check out my podcast called stratford red devils also my youtube channel which you'll find in the link below if you're watching via youtube if you're listening via the podcast app you'll find links to the podcast easy isn't it easy come easy go so wednesday i'm feeling hype i'm feeling good and i'm also surprised and really amazed that this guy 
And if you're not familiar who that is, that's Trippy Red's album. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm probably going to get content ID'd. But Trippy Red has sold over 100,000 um, units of his um, recent album that just came out, which is called, for the love of it, um, A Love Letter to You, Volume 4, or Number 4. Bloody hell, man. Amazing. And I'm happy for the kid because I think that exclamation mark album that came out earlier this year that Playboy Carti ended up having a track on and took it off again. I don't know what happened there. They probably had some dispute, but it didn't really um, get the reception it deserved. And I've long argued, even though he's a very, he's a proper terrible performer. If you watch these videos on, on um, Rolling Loud and stuff, for the amount of talent that Trippy Red has, he needs to invest a lot more time and a lot more money and effort into his live shows because i think if you put that effort into his live shows same as say about playboy Carter, i think in my opinion again argue as much as you want but in my humble opinion trippy red playboy Carter, Lil uzi vert are really on another level in concern of all those other kids and that kind of soundcloud kind of aesthetic of rapping right whatever you may call it whatever that theme is they're they're in a league of their own trippy red uzi vert and playboy Carty. but of the three, the one person I'd want to go see perform live specifically is probably Lil Uzi Vert. And Lil Uzi Vert still has that thing that annoys me the most about hip hop artists where they always scream over a vocal backing track. There's no um, there's no effort to try and sing their songs live, especially in a case, maybe Lil Uzi Vert has more of an excuse because, you know, if you break down some of his raps and go on Genius, you can see he packs a lot of words into like into into his verses. So maybe he might run out of breath and, you know, it's hard to kind of do the whole breath control when you're on stage running around, jumping around, jumping off the, um, the, um, the scaffolding of a stage and stuff. But for the rest of them, such as Trippy Red, such as Playboy Carti, who, you know, for the most part, it's a vibe, it's a melody. There's no excuse for them to be having the vocal back and track in the background and then just screaming on top of it. You should be able to perform live and just be able to kind of, you know, enunciate your words properly um, and just kind of get the crowd hype. Because I've, if you've seen the videos, you'll see that essentially Trippy Red and Playboy Carti act as their own little hype man, right? So they basically stand in front of the stage, jump around and just scream, you know, especially in, in, in um, Trippy Red's case, you know, 10, 14, whatever it may be, and that's it. But I honestly, after listening to this album, if he invests a little bit of time, especially some of the acoustic, um, acoustic sounding tracks in the first half of this album, that's nothing to specify too. You know how hard this album is because there's 21 tracks, and I wouldn't take any track away. They're all fucking bangers. And the thing that's amazing about this album, um, a love letter for you, which is on here on the screen. I recommend you go check it out. It's available now on iTunes and all your streaming platforms. Um, the incredible thing is that the first half of the album is pretty slow. It's pretty melodic. Um, it's pretty somber, a lot of heartbreak and turmoil in there. And then it just flips the script. The second half of the album just starts punching you in the face again and again and again. That track that I played recently now with um, this production of this track, this little Yatty and Pierre, Pierre Bourne. Like, this is prime uh, uh, Pierre Bourne, prime, prime um, era Pierre Bourne. So definitely check it out. Um, one of my favorite albums that's come out of the last few weeks. I've been playing it again and again since I've been going to gym. This alongside the game album is just, you know, my hands down easily. Some of the best albums I've dropped in the last few months. Again, tri uh, check out Trippy Red. Um, if anyone from your team is listening, please invest in some kind of um, perf uh, what you call it? live performance training, choreography. Allow him, maybe even the first half of the tracks. If he just did an acoustic version of those tracks in the beginning of his concerts or something, or a little intermission and perform some of the tracks, especially... Uh, Lee Ray, the one that's you know been causing most of the controversy, that would be amazing. Please, let's see that. And just in general, man, just perform live without a backing track. That's where the Migos really up their levels. The Migos, obviously, Bad and Bougie, you know, took them to a whole di different direction, a whole different audience was exposed to the Migos. But I think another part of it as well, if you check out the actual live performances, the Migos perform live. They actually rap on stage. They're not just mumbling. They're not just shouting over an MP3. They're actually rapping live over instrumental. I would love to see Trippy Red, Lil, um, Playboy Carti especially do the same thing. And that would definitely take them to the next level. Hopefully it happens. Um, and again, it will make your it will make you spending the money to go see these guys much more worth it. Because at the moment, when you go and see them play, it's like... <sighs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I really wish that happens. Hopefully it happens. Hopefully it does happen very, very soon. Anyway, apart from that, this is the Action of Zingas show, episode number 266, I think, for the most part. 267, I'm not sure which one it is, but you'll hear it when you hear it. As per usual, I talk about mostly things concerning streetwear, music, art, and culture, and that malarkey. So if you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review so people can help find the show. If you're watching via the YouTube, smash that like button, click subscribe, leave me a comment, and let me know what you think of the show. So, loads of topics to talk about, loads of things to get into before I head off to work. Let's get into it right now. Babidi 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 bab. Uh, what do we have here? Number one, we got this weird Peloton ad. Uh, cool. This this is the Peloton that I want to check out, right? And again, I'm, it's weird only because of who it's okay, kind of marketed to, right? And it's something that I've kind of been trying to figure out for a while now, and I've not really had the answer to it. Um, can someone explain to me why 
it seems as if because I think some of these marketing departments, as as much as people like to like you know point fingers and you know ha ha he he had these adverts that you know probably don't hit the mark or a little bit tone deaf. I think a lot of these marketing events, the marketing initiatives are usually driven by customer insights. They usually go out there, they kind of scope the field, see what people are saying, judge the sentiment, and then kind of try to reply or answer or basically deliver a piece of content that speaks directly to that audience, right? So this Peloton ad, as cringy as it may be, I think it definitely does speak to the core audience of Peloton. And if anything, it does represent the trouble that some of these luxury higher ticket brands have in terms of communicating the fact that they only appeal to people who have you know a disposable income high net worth whatever it may be right or good jobs whatever it may be and the one thing that's always really this really kind of i've really been confused about when it comes to advertising marketing especially when it comes to marketing geared more so towards women or towards young women or well, towards them um, you know women that are like establishing their career but i'd say between the ages of like 19 and 45 why is it that, especially with that documentary that's out at the moment about that Italian influencer, Chiari, what's her name again? Let me see if I can get it up on here. Uh, uh, Chiari, what's her name? That's the one. Chiari, Chiari Ferragani, Chiari Ferragani, I'm posted, right? This girl. So this lady here, even though the, the, it's got like two star, one and a half star review on IMBD, but this young lady is an Italian influencer, which I'm pretty sure you guys are aware of, right? So Chiara Ferragini, right? A, an, an Italian influencer, it's, it's a documentary called Unposted. I think it's available now on Amazon. And essentially, you know, follows this Italian influencer around the world as she, you know, basically influences. But if you look at her story, you look at where she's come from, she's essentially just a rich girl that, you know, buys fashion and got popular on social media. You know, you've heard that story before, it's all well and good. The issue that I have with it is that I don't understand why norm, your average, your, your kind of everyday girl on Instagram looks up to a chiara i don't get it why are why are fem why are women so quick to be fans of people who are just uber rich and you know clearly they're only famous because their parents were able to make a buttload of cash and give them some money so they can pursue their life on social media i don't get i don't see why that's compelling content similar to the kind of olivia jade girl right um the, with the i think she's the daughter of the woman that got charged for the uh college um, enrollment scandal thing why was she so popular on YouTube when she essentially just a rich girl? Is it because girls are, as most people are, quite, quite just curious to see how the other side live? But if there's nothing relatable about it. She, you know, she, she, her bills are paid before they even hit her account. She gets a monthly stipend in her account that's probably more than some people's salary. I don't see the real draw for it. So that's, that's one thing, right? I don't see why women are just into this stuff, sort of stuff, like following rich girls around. And then when you look at the Peloton ad, um, it kind of answers that because for the most part, this Peloton ad is directly aimed at especially women who are, you know, extremely wealthy. And every Peloton ad that I've seen so far, again, it's one of some really is, maybe that, that's where probably people maybe, maybe um, an, 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 analyze how Apple did it with the MacBooks. Because the MacBooks are not cheap items, but I want a MacBook, for instance, right? And I'm, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I'm a millionaire yet. And people who have a high net worth also want MacBooks and they show them off as a point of, you know, as a form of luxury. Um, why is it? How does how does that work compared to Peloton? Why are why doesn't MacBooks or why don't Apple get the same level of stick that Peloton does? Even though there are there is some conversation around the MacBooks being overpriced, especially nowadays with the rise of Google Chromebooks and stuff and other laptop manufacturers coming out and really trying to push Apple as far as they can go. There may be more questions that are being risen from it, but for the most part, people tend to like not really poo poo Apple when they advertise the MacBook. So why does the Peloton get such stick? Well, it's because adverts like this. First of all, when you get up on the screen, you've got a picture. The first image seen is of this young lady, fairly fit, with a really cute little daughter in her hand and toe, in this amazing apartment with these massive, you know, floor to ceiling windows that, you know, look out into a snowy garden. It's Christmas, it's snowing outside, the garden looks perfect, the perfect size for a daughter, perfect size for a, uh, the husband to go out and do some pull ups, the perfect size for the wife to go out and do some yoga, and a kitchen counter that probably bigger than my entire kitchen right so that's the first scene and then it goes into this whole uh diatribe which is okay, funny as hell now a peloton the husband gifts the wife with a peloton bike oh my god a peloton bike and just behind the peloton bike what do you see you see an open fire flame right not artificial kind not the ones that you see with the screen an actual real fire with logs on it a, a tree in front of it with an assortment of gifts different sizes different kind of gifts tiffany bracelet tiffany ring tiffany shoes tiffany bag tiffany 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 all over the place probably and a lovely peloton bike right in front of it 
all set up and ready to go. I'm sure Peloton bikes don't come assembled, so the husband had to probably hire somebody from my builder or rated people or one of these companies, whatever sort of companies, and get them to assemble the thing. Or if he's handy and he's he himself is an electronic engineer or a product designer, he probably put it together himself. Give it up for our first time ride. All right, first ride. I'm a little nervous. And here's sorry. obviously, and of course, the the wife who is maybe a stay at home influencer mum is a big on social media, even though she's recording the video in landscape mode. That lets you know she probably has her own YouTube channel, and she's now recording herself sitting on this Peloton bike, riding it in the house and riding it into a structure. Now, the in interesting thing about your Peloton bikes is that I always got the feeling when I was doing something similar at home, these home workouts, which I was doing the, uh, oh, what's it called, man? The beach body. Remember the beach body workouts? I think with the, the, the black guy, I forgot that one that he was, he did, but I did that, um, workout. And I remember doing it at home first for a while. And now my mum's like, you know, just, you know, when you, you know, when you start doing stuff and then imagine you start immediately, especially if you're living at home, the moment you start doing things that people in your, people in your house aren't doing, everyone's got an opinion about it. You know, you start eating a different kind of food. My mum's like to, you know, tease me about, you know, whatever I was eating, it just got annoying after a period of time. So my mum's like questioning me about my workouts. I just thought, you know what? Too much eyes on me as I'm doing the thing. I just got to do it in the park. So I'll, I'll download i would rip the kind of beach body workouts onto my iPad or onto a laptop. No, I had no, I had the iPad at that time. Remember, I, I had an iPad that I borrowed from work. And then I'd go to a park and then start doing the workouts, right? And of course, naturally, what happens when you go work out in the park and you've got your specific thing you're doing, some wild lad comes along and starts asking, oh, mate, can I join in? Like, God, no, you can't join in. What do you want us to do? Like, stand side to side and start doing burpees. Do you know how off-putting that is? Like, I don't know you, brother. I'm not going to, I don't even want to shake your hand, let alone do burpees side to side to you. So that was annoying. So then eventually I stopped doing it altogether and I just did the normal thing where normal people do. I got a gym membership, right? I went to the gym, I started running outside and things were okay. But I think that that kind of uh, at-home workout thing is a good primer before you head off to the gym, especially for me. I was a bit overweight. I was I didn't have that much self-confidence. So the initial weight loss and, you know, um, confidence of kind of gaining that coordination of your body, because if you've gone from the couch to working out in the gym, you know how hard it is just to kind of get your body to coordinate, right? Even when it comes to machines, you don't know where to put your hands, how do your shoulders fit? You're looking at the little instructions on the machine. It's really hard. So these little at-home workout things, I get why they work because it allows people just to kind of get a little little bit confident have a little bit more assurance about how their body moves and then from there evolve and go on to the next step i don't think you do this until the end right sometimes that's why when they use these models with super chiseled abs and stuff it's quite ridiculous because for the most part these guys are maybe doing these at-home workouts as a top-up but they're not spending their, their predominant workout time isn't going to be centered around staring at a screen you know looking out onto their beautiful snowy garden that's not going to happen but if again we digress the woman is now looking at the camera telling herself how sweaty she is she's got the little sweat on they probably sprayed her with a bit of mist that they got from lush or something into her face to make her look wet and sweaty and now she's going to be pounding on that bike trying to get that body fit and prim okay let's do this five days in a row you surprised i am 6 a.m. So weird. Yay. Rising with the sun. That was totally weird. It's just it. so weird. Look, look and, and six and it's going on. The seasons have changed now. Outside is sunny. There's lounge chairs out there. There's a guy now giving her instructions because obviously in the summer, guys are the best instruction givers. And now she's staring doughy eyed into the camera, thinking, oh my God, I, this is just so hard. But I'm so thankful for this. And it continues. Boston, she's racing. I just don't understand this. And then for some reason, do people do this? Do people cast their own um totally their own videos on a t on a flat tv screen to watch with their spouses is that a thing is that a thing that people do that that is so bizarre like i would hate it like I, it annoys me actually i'm getting wet hot and sweating it annoys me when my friends pull me up and tell me oh i watch a video on youtube it's so cringe you get so embarrassed i can only imagine the level of ego the level of narcissism that would need to be involved for a person to put their youtube video or an instagram story up on the big screen on their tv or and and then get their partner to sit down and watch them ride a bike that's right next to them right it's not like they're sitting down in another room they're sitting down in the living room watching a tv of a bike that's sitting right there this is bizarre beyond belief but what can you say? A year ago, I didn't realize how much this would change me. Thank you. This holiday. As if your daughter's going to be sitting there watching mommy just ride a bike. She wants a bit of cereal. She wants a sandwich, man. Get off that bike. Stop doing it like the great fear of own jokes. Put down the, the, the deadlifts, you know. Put down the barbell, Cynthia, and go make some. I'm going to make my daughter a sandwich. She's crying. Do you know what I mean? What the fuck is this? This is insane. And again, this is going to be very popular to the female audience. I just don't understand it because this... This doesn't speak to the wide majority of women out there. For the most part, 
would a, would a lot of women be willing to spend that much amount of money on a on a stationary bike in the first place would they want to work out to extent at home have they got the room for it it's just so many if buts and maybes and again how big is that would maybe that's a point maybe that's a point similar to like slamming kicks or a flight club because they've got high ticket items they can afford not to sell many of them because if they sell one they essentially pay for their rent right if you if you're a flight club if you sell a couple m m jordan fours you're basically covered for half a year so maybe a peloton if they sell five or four of these machines and again how how often do you have to change a peloton bike like is it like an iphone do they suddenly go do they suddenly do they suddenly become obsolete when the peloton bike 4.0 comes out or can you just use the same one you've had for five years I don't know, right? And again, if you're not using it that often, you probably won't get that much wear out of it. I'm pretty sure you can get over the air updates on it. It's just in a bizarre, and, and but it's a common thing you see a lot with um with these fashion, uh, fitnessy model type influencers in the women's market. They seem to appeal to the everyday person, which I don't get. I don't think this could run in guy circles. I don't think a guy is watching Cristiano Ronaldo being an influencer and thinking that they're going to get the same physique as him if they buy that set of ad machine. They're just letting him get his money. Get, get, you know, get, give him a couple of likes, give him a couple of dab taps on Instagram and keep him moving. But I think there's some women that actually believe if they get one of these bikes at home, they're going to suddenly turn into Angela Jolie. And it's just like, it's a bizarre because first of all, you've got to afford it. These things are not cheap, right? It's like when I tried to buy a Concept 2 row machine for my place and I just realized, I went online, I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'll just go, I'll just carry on using it at the gym then. Do you know what I mean? It's not, the, these items are not cheap in the slightest. And yeah, I just don't get it. I really don't understand. But again, big up Peloton for uh, doing this. I think as a branding thing, it's pretty cool that they have this item, this product that essentially is only, you know, you only, the only, I don't think exercise bikes even had a brand name before peloton came around maybe the concept 2 is a good example the row machine i don't think it was there no one ever cared about a branding name of a peloton of a you know stationary bicycle and peloton have kind of uh, created this whole culture behind it, a whole scene david beckham is probably the most prominent um, ambassador of peloton he's always going to classes or spin classes they use peloton bikes and spin right or is it their spin bicycles i'm not sure but he's always going to those classes with his little cycling shoes in hand in new york or wherever he travels in america so that's a good thing but for the most part bloody hell man it's a very very bizarre thing that these things are so popular especially with the wide majority of people out there who aren't are unable to afford them but you know again maybe that's the whole point of branding isn't it Let's be able to kind of give people the illusion or the assumption they're going to be able to afford something that they clearly can't and it doesn't really appeal to them in the same regard as well but you know what can you do with that regard let's move on from there what else have we got on the list that we want to talk about here oh dior and stussy stussy and nike so as you guys are aware um dior did their pre-fall collection 20 or the pre-fall yeah pre-fall 2020 collection yesterday um all the stars came out all the glitz and glamour all the influences all the details but the most striking content the most striking news of the whole event was the fact that sean stussy came out of retirement to lend his creative hand uh with kim jones's collection with dior and not to obviously kim jones streetwear route so i'm really happy about kim jones is probably one of the most unapologetic streetwear aficionados fans fanatics on the fashion runway scene apart from maybe jun takahashi and maybe to a certain extent, uh, Virgil, what he's doing at Louis Vuitton. But for the most part, everyone else is sort of trying to push away their streetwear influence, their streetwear influences on their runway and trying to return back to tailoring as a weird sort of dog whistle to get all the urban people out of the scene. That's my opinion. No one else thinks that, but that's my opinion. But I like that Kim Jones being an OG streetwear fan, being somebody that's obsessed with Hiroshi Fujiwara as much as I am being a, a gimme five alumni is able to kind of tap in and kind of bring these stalwarts and bring these icons of streetwear's past back into the forefront we saw it previously with uh what uh, virgil did with futura uh bringing back futura to do that michael jackson inspired collection graffiti and stuff and now he's doing some capsule collections with him with a nike collaboration they've got and some other jeans i pro with uh, fl studios and now we're seeing kim jones do the same thing by bringing, um, essentially bringing um, Sean Stussy out of retirement and allowing him to kind of remind people just how much of a legend he is and why he's so influential. As you're aware, Sean Stussy left the Stussy brand, his namesake, a while back ago. He started up um, S Double. I'm pretty sure I put out a couple of shoes. I had one pair that I had bought before that were quite cool, but for the most part, he's been pretty quiet. I had the pleasure of actually speaking to him a couple of times when I was working at a previous company for a collaboration that we were meant to do that didn't come through, but that was one of my... Uh, things I look back on and really kind of proud of that I was able to reach out to him get some contacts and I was able to kind of talk to him and kind of explain my project but at the time it just didn't work out scheduling wise a complete gentleman a real top guy and somebody who essentially you know was able to kind of exit on his own terms and live 
and idyllic life surfing and eating coconuts. So let's um, describe the whole collection. There's loads of pictures up on here that I want to go through. And then we're going to get to the main chunk of the situation, which is, of course, the Jordan uh, and Stu uh, sorry, the Jordan, the Dior and Nike Jordan Air 1 collaboration that everyone's creaming themselves over. So let's go into this first one. We've got um, details, number one, of the Air Jordan OG, right? A closer look at them. Now, on the closer expansion and on the first initial um, view of what I've seen via Travis Scott's picture of them and these product shots here I have on Hypebeast, I'm going to go out flat out and say I'm not a fan of the colorway. Just not a fan. It's not for me. I'm not involved. Um, <clears throat> I think, by and large, I think the last few seasons or the last few years, we've probably seen enough Jordan 1s to probably, you know, uh, last of lifetime. I think Nike is sort of falling into a trap that they fell into in the early 2000s until maybe about 2010, where essentially there were no new ideas really coming out of the Nike lab. They were kind of worried of of maybe testing the waters with some new models and were instead um, hell bent on putting out retros that for the most part weren't really hitting the mark, right? A lot of retros they put out, like the Air Max Lite, which I'll never forgive Nike for absolutely botching that retro. It was one of the most popular Nike runners that hadn't been released in a while or Air Maxes. And when they put them out, they completely botched the tooling on them, botched the uppers on them, and they made them look nothing similar to what the OGs look like. All the all the beauty and all the emotion and all the kind of um, power that came from the Air Max Lite was completely devoided when they just smashed up the, the upper and made that weird banana foot uh, silhouette that we know and love from the Nike Air Stab, which is another really big letdown. So in that era, they just we regurgitating Jordans. That was a kind of era where we got Jordans coming out of the woodwork in every sort of way. And I remember Jordan brand being a little bit dismissive of the fact, saying that they were only going to put out a certain amount. And of course, Nike's bottom line is the most important thing. So they end up just cranking up the machine, churning out loads of Jordans. And now we've got inundated with Jordan 1s all over the place. And now the most iconic Jordan in the Jordan 1 is not special anymore. The value that the Jordan 1 once had, the reason why a lot of these influences back in the day some of the people that everyone followed that i don't really give a toss about that were going out and buying og jordan ones and making them really expensive and making them really popular now that whole appeal is gone why would you buy a nike a jordan a jordan one from 90s 80s now just you know I, unless you just wanted to do it for your own for your own kind of vanity for the most part you can get a similar kind of look with another jordan coming out you know every other month so they sort of devalue the item itself so that um, on that case, just looking at it, I'm kind of tired of it. I think the colorway itself, I'm a bit disappointed. It being Kim Jones too. Kim Jones is a big Jordan 1 aficionado. If you've ever read interviews of his, when he's talking about Hiroshi or just talking about his Turner collection, he's always wearing a pair of Jordan 1s for the most part, always a pair of Nikes really for the most part, based on his, on his close connection with the people at Nike, with people like Fraser Cook and stuff. But it's a real disappointing colorway, I think, overall. Again, it ties in a lot with his collection, which we'll check out later. But I think as a colorway, I think as a design, he could have done a lot more with it. It's a bit underwhelming. And again, something that I think would only sell just because of the names that are attached to it and the fact that it's a Dior uh, Jordan 1. Now, there is some nods to the fact that it's taking inspiration from the kind of bootleg Air Force One era that we used to see back in the day where people were kind of taking uh, authentic Gucci, um, Louis Vuitton, Fendi fabric and sort of putting those on the side of the swoosh. I'm sure people are familiar with Meteor Sports doing the same sort of thing in the UK and other places probably in the US doing it. So there's, I like that kind of nod on it, but as an overall shoe, I think that probably would have worked out better if it was completely white and just taking inspiration from the kind of white and white Air Force Ones with the sort of, um, the edit on the swoosh with the fabric on it. But as it is, this sort of like gray tail kind of upper, doesn't, I'm just not a fan of looking at the pictures here. And again, it's just initial impressions. I'm just not a fan of it. I just don't think it looks that good. Um, you've got obviously the Jordan, uh, the Air Dior emblem on the side with the wings on it, which is a good little nod there. It's got metal uh, tips on the laces, which is a good little detail. I like the piping, actually. That's the, that's the thing I do like. The piping around the Swish is quite interesting. Maybe the fact that they've been launched in Miami or Basel might make some sense, or during that season might make there's reason why there's maybe there's a colorway looks this way. I like the piping around the swoosh I mentioned before. That looks quite cool. But overall, as a collaboration, it's got Miami on the tag on the inside. And of course, the IC translucent sole at the bottom written with Dior. So again, I think for the flossy boys, the kind of dudes that wear Jordan 6 influence with skinny jeans with their knees out and leather jackets, I think this is probably perfect for you if you're the kind of person that sits on lounge chairs and uh, members only clubs or in like, you know, one oak and stuff and you want to have your feet up. I think that's quite good. It's sort of like a Jordan Louboutin in that respect. But I think for a sneaker head as a colorway, I'm a bit underwhelmed. I think if you like this colorway and you hate the sneakers and stuff, Jordan 1, there's something wrong with you. I think the sneakers and stuff, Jordan 1 colorway is better than this. Personally, I would say my, my own humble opinion. I'm not sure if, if you guys agree with it. Let me see if I can quickly get it up here. 
Uh, bu- 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 sneakers and stuff Jordan 1 of course as a story the Jordan 1 and Dior and Kim Jones is probably a lot more there's a lot more to that story than the, the, what we're seeing with this now but I don't know man I think this colorway works a lot better in my opinion personally where is it it's a, I definitely saw it the other day sneakers and stuff Air Jordan 1 they had a collaboration it just, it's just come out recently I'm pretty sure I'm seeing images here but, 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 but. yeah here we go this shoe I think this shoe is far, far superior to, than the than what we're seeing here from Dior. So I'll get up on the screen. This this shoe here, this is far superior than the Dior, in my opinion, colorway wise. Again, both probably as interesting as they're probably probably as uninteresting as each other. But I think if you're gonna go for that kind of white upper shoe, I like the fact that if you look at this kind of shoe, the sneakers and stuff shoe specifically, if you zoom in a little bit. It's uh, essentially got those sealed seams on the edges and the toe box. It's sort of like a tumbled leather and a new buck toe box there in the front, which looks beautiful. And you're sure they're going to age and wear really nicely. And again, just as an upper choice in terms of the white and grey with the pop of the red at the top, it reminds me a lot of the kind of OG um, kind of Nike basketball shoes that weren't Jordans. I had a pair of them before. I think they called a tax or something. I've got the name of them, but they kind of remind me of that sort of colorway. So again, I prefer these to the Dior ones. But going back to Dior, again, they've got the piping around the suit, which is probably the best bit about it. Um, and again, I'm just not that enamored with them, man. I think they could have, I think you could have came across a lot harder with them. Again, cool details on it. The fact that they've got Dior on the wings on the side. They've also got Dior written on the tip of the laces. And I think if you zoom in on the tongue here, there's also a Dior uh, motif embellished all over the foam bit of the tongue there so that's pretty cool to check out right so that looks amazing um for people that want that kind of shoe it's supposed to be going to be priced at like two thousand dollars or some stuff um or something like that so you know that rules out a whole chunk of people because you know straight away if it's going to be priced at that amount that means the retail price is going to be ext extremely high now i'm not sure why they're priced that high i'm not sure it's because they're using the dior fabric which is you know quite high cost or i'm not sure because it's just the name because I, I can't remember a shoe that's cost that much that was available for retail even the Supreme Louis Vuitton trainers, how much did they cost? And they were, yeah, that's the thing. They were Supreme. They were Supreme and Louis Vuitton. So they were Louis Vuitton tooling shoes, right? The kind of chunky, um, orthopedic sort of looking trainers, right? They were a little. Bit, they were They were Louis Vuitton inline trainers. So I'm not sure why these cost so much. That's the troubling part of it. Um, but it says the following here from Hypebeast, just after the Nike officially unveiled its Jordan Air Bra Air Jordan One. OG collaboration with Dior. We now have a take a closer look in question. Shown in Miami as part of the Dior 4 Winter Pre 4 collection. The Dior A Jordan 1 OG takes classic 1985 silhouette and brings it to new heights. Just in time for the A Jordan's 35th anniversary. Okay, that's probably why they're doing it then. 35th anniversary. The sneak utilizes Dior's expertise in leather goods and blends them with the Nike Sports Athletic. Okay, so it's Dior up. So it's Dior leather. The uppers feature one of Dior's first shades, Dior Grey, with the 1947 painted across number of panels and a remixed Dior Jumpman wing logo and a co-branded Air Jordan tongue and a Nike swoosh. Okay, that makes sense. Love mixing. I love mixing together different worlds, different brands. So Jordan brand and Dior are both em emblematic of absolute excellence in their fields. To bring them together in this special collaboration is to propose something exciting and truly new. So it's Kim Jones, assistant director of Dior Men. So cool. That looks fairly cool, I think, in that regard. Again, not for me. I'm not a fan of them at all. Not because I won't be able to get a pair, but I just think as a colorway, they're a bit boring. Um, so we move on from there and we take a look at the collection because that's quite interesting, I thought. Ba, 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 ba. We see some other images of course of the Jordans. They, they're everywhere, innit? Two pieces of two stories from Hypebeast about the same trainer. Incredible, and They do this quite often, actually. Even with Supreme, they'll just break down every bit of items, outwear, accessories, just to get the click rates for it. You gotta rate Hypebeast, man. They know they know what they're doing when it comes to getting the clicks on this site. So let's get this um, image up here. Another headline from Hypebeast, Dior and Jordan brand unveil long awaited Air Jordan 1 High OG collabo. Now, looking at them on foot, they do look a lot better. So if I have to take something back, I'll say initial reactions, they do look a lot better with them on foot, but still, I think they're entirely boring. I don't think they're worth the hassle to really go out and get a pair. The story about them is obviously quite unique. The fact that, you know, Kim Jones is a big, avid, is an avid streetwear fan, uh, Jordan 1 aficionado, what he said previously in a statement about the two brands being experts in their field and joining together is incredible. But the the most interesting part of it I like is the socks. I think the socks are pretty cool. Um, really cool socks. A great length for a pair of um, Air Jordan highs with obviously the Dior written in the sort of uh, quintessential Sean Stucci font. I quite like the look of those. I think the, the socks look really interesting. I wonder what they're going to retail for. 
the cashmere socks are somewhere loud. But yeah, the the actual official product shots make the shoe look a lot better. But still, I don't think they're worth the hassle, and they're a bit underwhelming for all the hype that's been caused around them. Um, so here's a uh, Jordan Brand uh, VP of Design Martin Lotti said the following: Every collaboration we do starts from a genuine connection and desire to expand and dimension of each brand through. De- creativity and design and innovation now they always say that in it every collaboration we do is a friendship we're connected it's about real appreciation blah 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 but as it when are they ever going to come out and say look we're just doing it for a cash grab he's kim jones he's the head of dior we're jordan brand we're dying on our feet we need another spruce up you know when are they ever going to say never going to say that so these are this idea that every collaboration is some sort of unique collaboration between two people who happen to cross paths at the same gallery who happen to be at the same bar is nonsense we know that for the most part most of these individuals, these high companies, have been in their jobs for years, maybe decades. So if you hang around for long enough and you you know move positions here and there, you can exchange favors from friends to friends. And it's also quite nice if you actually have a friend. Imagine if this uh, Martin Lotti guy is actually a mate of of Kim Jones, who used to work at you know X brand, and now he's at Jordan Brand, and suddenly now this collaboration opens up again. That's quite cool because I'm pretty sure whatever Fraser Cook handles in terms of his marketing side is separate from Jordan Brand. They probably don't intermingle. Probably Fraser Cook can lend a good ear or a good introduction to kim jones but kim jones obviously needs his own people to kind of give him the stamp of approval so the fact that it got approved is sick but this idea that this is a special thing is a bit bizarre every collaboration text is basically like this isn't it but anyway it continues um, our partnership with maison dior will offer a new look into a style of basketball it's a new look though really and blend a high-end streetwear with luxury fashion I'm, I'm glad i said streetwear in the copy and didn't try and shy away from it that's pretty cool um we'll pay homage to both brands rich iconography and draw inspiration from our heritage but it's, hmm, it's a bit bland though isn't it like i said i'm not really a big fan of it i think it's a little bit um yeah the video looks cool though again i'm just not a fan of it again um, you know what I hate also? I hate the fact that they didn't relace the shoe for the product shots. It's one of my pet peeves when it comes to product shots. You just leave the laces like that. Like, you know laces where you see how a shoe might be out on size, just like put out there with no love or support. If I go to like a sneaker store, I want to see the shoes laced properly. I want to see them, you know, the, the laces go over, under, over, under, that way up, right? That way, like a V-shape. Um, I also want to see, you know, nice and packed and full, but not squeezed tight like the way Marquise Brownlee squeezes the Jordan 1s. Don't strangle them like that. You know, give them a bit of, give them a bit of space. And just generally make them look like, you know, how they look like on my feet. That's the one place. It would be nice if the actual dual hang tag thing was real sterling silver. That would de- that would be nuts. I'm, I'm not sure if it is, and you could actually put that in your chain or something. That would be crazy. And it had maybe the um, Kim Jones signature with Dior, and maybe it might have said the number and the serial code of it. That would be sick. That would be sick. But yeah, a um, bit average, isn't it? I'm not really that bothered about him. I, I don't know what you guys think about it, but I'm not that bothered about it. You can check out the video yourself on Kim Jones' Instagram. And then to move on to the collection, I think I've got a picture of the actual collection, don't I? Da, 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 da. Yeah, let's go to the collection because I think that's quite interesting. The show looked pretty cool because, of course, Sean Stussy was involved in it, lended his artistic help to it. This is a review from the Ra from Vogue Runway. Quickly read you this review from a one Nicole Phelps. We kind of detail some of her experience sitting there front row at the show, and then we'll go through some people's Instagram stories and show you behind the curtains like you were actually there. So here we go. Kim Jones has remade Dior Men uh, top to the bottom in the 18 months since his debut, which is very true. That debut collection from Kim Jones was probably one of the worst introductions to a brand I've maybe seen in a long time. It was so safe, it was so predictable, so just middle of the road, so vanilla. But of course, because he's supremely talented, supremely gifted designer, he just went bah, 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 just shifted into fifth gear. And since then, he's just dropped heater after heater after heater collection. Just came with the heat. Honestly, go back and look at this first collection he did. The one with the the one that had the massive cores uh, insulation in the, in the middle. It was dead. It was horrible. Like m- there was a lot more glitz and all the outside stuff made more sense. I remember they had that big Dior flower thing that everyone was standing in front of. All that stuff was better than the actual show itself. It was so terrible. But somehow he absolutely upped the levels. And I guess that's what happens when you're an expert designer. You have to kind of come in, I think, on the house, sort of like um, establish your codes, establish your motifs, your themes, your color palettes, and then sort of build upon that and just deliver after deliver. And then that's where you have to kind of give really give credit to Kim Jones in that regard. He's probably the safest bet in industry of fashion now if you put him in charge of your house you give him free reign to do what he needs to do from top to bottom he will deliver and he will make sales because people buy this stuff even the stuff that he's done with the leaks i will say matthew williams in terms of the buckle stuff with the bags that's been incredible he actually delivers at the big because you know i'm seeing people actually wearing dior um head to toe now 
Like, especially the rappers, you probably wouldn't have gave it that much of a look in. It's getting a lot of love from there too. So definitely check those out. Anyway, continues the review here. In his debut with a golden, with a global team, with artist collaborations, and with a saddle bag for dudes to say nothing of the uh, pageantry he's brought to the house's pantsuits. But the most um, Jonesian development of all is the synthesis of high and low, the culture of the street, which I'm a big appreciator of. Again, he's the only one in fashion now, apart from maybe Jun Takahashi, who's actually flying the banner for streetwear and unashamed to say, yes, my influence is coming from the street. I love that industry. Most people are just kind of staying away from it and trying to go back to their idea of tailoring and proper fashion, whatever that may mean. But the most um, Jonesian development of all is the synthesis between high and low, culture and street. So integral is uh, this intermingling to his Dior Men project that Jones rejects the distinction between the categories as old fashioned and out of touch. Today, people buy what's the best, he said in a pre show interview. The implications being that Dior Men is deserving of that superlative. The sales results bear that out, which I'm a big fan of. You know, people just. People just buy what they want to buy now. I think the idea that you can go into Selfridges or into the Dover Street Market and you can you can be convinced to buy something due to the merchandising of the store is a bit is a bit redundant. I'm sure maybe some merchandisers might argue with me, but I think for the most part, the merchandising of a store is just your you know it's it's mostly of artistic artistic expression. You're mostly just trying to you know. Um, uh, design the flow of a store but in order to kind of merchandise a store to kind of drive sales a certain brand doesn't work i don't care how many t-shirts are alongside a yoji, Yam y yoji yamamoto blazer if i want the blazer i'll buy the blazer if i want the t-shirt i'll buy the t-shirt so that's the way it is right the sales re the sales results better out the article says and jones show in miami beach tonight should only make them rosier that must have been a vibe in it imagine going to see a dior show collaboration with stussy with jordan ones running down the runway in bloody miami that must have been a vibe so nice and warm drinking cocktails the beach blah 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 must have been so cool let's start with a little uh, matter of the collaboration with Sean Stushi who reimagined the house logo MB which is amazing right when the partnership was announced a day ahead of the show the internet lit up with anticipation Joan was a pre, uh, was a pre 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 preternatural ability pre natural ability sorry preternatural ability I don't know what that word is I can't say it for creating buzz. Anyway, recall the supreme collab he engineered while still at Louis Vuitton. On the surface, the sushi arrangement might appear shrewd. A supreme redo for his new French label, but it's absolutely authentic. Jones began buying sushi at 14 with money he saved up from a job washing dishes at a cafe. And he remembers copying Sean Sushi's familiar scroll in his school books. Of course, we all did that, man. I remember that was the first thing I did uh, when I first got into streetwear as well. I started to get actual line sheets of old soup, of old Stussy line sheets from magazines that I have here, Japanese magazines like As Asanya, and like, you know, copying down, putting my own logo on it. We all did the same sort of thing because stussy has been, especially what we've seen now, he's built up so much of an archive of so many staple designs that he's been able to kind of the brand's been able to survive even without him at the helm now don't get me wrong the, what the guys are doing now the substitution design team is bloody incredible but you can't deny the codes and the foundation that he left were a1 um i don't so uh kim just says the following i don't choose people just because they're famous john said when something becomes as iconic as the, as that it's in the culture and culture is what i'm interested in which i'm a big fan of his as well for that there's doubtless many other facts fans out there eager to see stussy's first work in ages and he sold his company found 996 bloody hell man detail air jordan's acolytes the new air jordan made in italian factories using the same leather found in the french house bags okay that's probably why it's two thousand pounds then um featuring the trademark swoosh and the dior oblique logo jacket had its coming out on this night's runway it's been upscaled said jones who would know air jordans are one of the things the designer collects he upwards he has upwards of 40 pairs but the famous sneakers are only the beginning of the street chic blending here camp shirts in a classic duty style were minutely bent beaded one fantastic example took 2,600 2, hours to embroid Dior has the connections to Miami area, including what Jones described as a huge flagship Havana, Cuba. He layered in nods of the place by lifting the pasta leaf palette. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so loads of cool stuff there. Is Daniel Craig involved? What is it? See that because of the origin. Okay, cool. Anyway, let's see this. So the actual collection itself is gorgeous. I think some of the stuff that Stussy has done with it has been incredible. Obviously, you're seeing it with some of the tops and iconography all over the place and the reimagining of the Dior logo is really incredible. I think that Dior logo, Sean Stussy's script thing is going to sell like hotcakes. There's no denying that whatsoever. So again, the commercial viability of Kim Jones is incredible. The fact that he sent this out of his as his first look is essentially something you'd see um, Sean Stussy wear on holiday somewhere. A nice 
a, a nice bag, a great little Parisian sort of style hat, a great jumper with a shirt underneath, some really light, warm shorts, and of course the Jordans and socks on. A classic, classic outfit that would work both on the beach and in a club. An amazing, amazing um, debut from Kim Jones. Again, just great overall. Um, let's quick, take a quick scan of it. Again, some great sandals. The boots, he's always a good... Um, he's always an underrated um, maker of boots. I remember even some of the... I think it might have been the last collection that Louis Vuitton Kim Jones did. The one that was inspired by the African Sahara. There were some incredible boots in there. Some similar sort of tones. Really well done. Um, again, some great motifs on the shirt. Sort of like a tight... What do you call those kind of African print inspired stuff? I like some of the details on the hats. I like that bucket hat there. It's going to sell like absolute hotcakes. You know it's going to go well. These little accessories with little flowers on it. Some of the earrings look incredible. Again, little accessories such as the bags here in, in front. Like he's just a master of those little extra trinkets because I think he collects them anyway. Him being a fan of, you know, Hiroshi Fujiwara, who's a master of those little pouch trinkets, you know, little camera cases, uh, cases for a case, a case for a cable. Everything's everything's got a little case for it. I really love that. So he's able to kind of translate some of those likes or wants of his of his own wardrobe into the runway, which is great to see. Again, some great tones, some pastels, some nice browns. The trousers are always he's cut on his trousers are always superbly done. Again, a real update on that kind of loafer shoe model, which I'm a big fan of. A great little scarf motif on there, scarf tie thing. Those hats look really cool. I'm a big fan of, again, the earrings are incredible as well from the little detail I can see there. Again, just really expertly done. The shorts are a good length, great suiting, nice and relaxed fits. And just in general, you know this is all going to sell so, so well. This little chest piece that essentially is a collaboration with um, Elix again or Matthew Williams. And that fabric is incredible as well. That Dior logo and that hat. Like that hat, I might have to get. I have to get that hat. That French hat is just incredible. Look how beautiful that is in that Dior logo. In that Dior font with a Sean Stussy script. That's incredible. Great boots as well. That's really, really well done. And again, maybe a little nod to the past collection. With the suit sort of like remember they had those suits with the scarves that kind of go inside and sort of like slip in and sit on the outside so maybe that's kind of carry over from last season but again just brilliant brilliant stuff from um kim jones and stussy um very expertly done those hats those shoes those loafers there with the dior script on the top of them looks incredible and get a little update on the kind of penny loafers that i have from uh base what gh basis whatever they call that i've got um Again, really well done. Saddle bags, nice tote bags, overcoats, bucket hats, great prints on the trousers and shorts. This would be really popular when, especially imagine IB for season, all the house lads and the tech house lads, they'll love all this sort of stuff. Look at that. He's got, ah, oh, he's made a, a Dior um, Hydro Flask thing. That's going to be very popular as well. You know, look, all these accessories are going to sell like absolute hotcakes. Some of the sanders are going to do really well as well. Just incredibly creative in all regards no matter what you look at it, this is probably one of his strongest collections so far. And again, just go and see what he did in his first collection with Dior and see where it's at now. The levels are just insane. He's, he's, he's like essentially, like I said, like one of the best, um, one of the easiest people to book or to get in place as a head designer of your house. He's a commercial hit, man. He's able to design for the street and for the luxury clientele. Like, look at that. Look at that outfit. That is so gorgeous. Brown overcoat. A massive, nice, loose turtleneck. The shorts are a great length. I'm not sure what that fabric is either. That fabric is gorgeous, whatever that fabric is. Incredible piping. Similar, a kind of, uh, a nod to kind of Muay Thai shorts, it looks like, with obviously the leaks buckle on the belt and obviously the script on the on the belt as well. The Sun Sushi script looks bloody beautiful. Such a fan of everything that's on here. So gorgeous. So again, recommend you check it out. Really nice collection. Um, let's move on from there and maybe check out some of the front row images with some people that are at the show. You know, so it's fun to check some of that stuff out. Um, first of all, we've got the Instagram profile of Dior themselves. Let's see what they put up on there. Bapidi 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 ba. Can you load up, please? Um, who we have here dressing in there? So we've got some uh background videos from you know give us a feel on what it was about this is a text from dior caption says the dior men fall 2020 show is just around the corner we're not telling we're not telling what kim jones has dreamed up for his collection okay this, the copy on there is horrible uh there's no telling what kim jones has drawn for the collection but the vibes are palatable in this intense brightly colored video set to george's about the work oh the black and the black and the remix is suspect to see what if she played the show that's cool, man. That's really cool. Well done, Black Madonna. And it continues here. We've got another video. Same 
tune. I think that's what better than the runway, right? I saw that. That's so good. That's so good. Honestly, get yourself a good script. Get yourself a good a good throw up, and you are you are made it in life, innit? That oh, that Sean so good. Take the views again. Let's see what else we've got here on the show. So we've got a car here. You can feel the deal of Miami vibe. A gleaming row of uh, colorful vintage American cars lined the streets outside the Dior Men's Full Show. That's great to see as well. Again, I'm pretty sure this is a uh, a very authentic collaboration. You probably reached out to a, to like you know vintage uh, car dealer and got those cars from Miami Vice shipped in directly to the show as well. So no 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 uh, corners cut. That's what happens when you go to a big house, though, isn't it? You just have to exploit all the resources to hand because you won't get this chance again, especially with your own namesake label. The amount of money they threw at this, I, I would, just looking at the front row, the amount it must cost to book these people to come to your show is insane. So, you know, wow. Look at this, look at it, look at it outside. It looks incredible, isn't it? Bloody hell, it's beautiful. It's so cool, man. And then here's the inside of the show here, the auditorium. You've essentially got these two. You've got obviously the seats in the middle, which are quite on the front row, which is a great way to... I like the design of that show. Imagine kind of some old um, PB Fido shows. You did something similar where the middle bit, the middle concourse is sort of where all the VIP sit. And then you've got obviously the the little stands on the side where everyone else sits and stands. That looks really, really cool. Big fan of all of that. Oh, Prince Paleo. Long time not heard of him in a while. I remember him. He was a real big um, influence blogger back in the day. I think it's still around. Of course, David Beck wearing these sheer suits looks absolutely beautiful. David Beckham in that suit looks amazing, immaculate. You've got Kim Jones and uh, who's the other one? Courtney, I'm assuming. Great outfit as well. And then, of course, Travis Scott. He, Travis Scott doesn't really dress well. Is that can I can I say that out loud without sounding like a hater? I don't think he dresses pretty well. I think he's for his body, for his shape. And his frame, he doesn't do himself justice with stuff he wears, personally, I would say. I like the hat, though. The hat looks pretty cool. Is that a Dior hat as well or no? The Dior Snapchat. That'd be quite cool. Do you reckon they're going to do that? Do you reckon they're going to do the Dior, the Sean City script in a Dior camp hat, like a five-panel hat? That would look, look incredible. And then who else we got here? We have a friend of House Wang. The friend, the friend of the house, Wang Jukani. Junkai, I'm not sure who that is. His outfit looks cool, though. I love that all over print with Dior all over it. It looks pretty cool. And then lastly, we have Jay Park and Gray, right? Wearing the suit as well. It looked really cool in that regard. And of course, Maluma, the main man, the most handsome man in the world, wearing the outfit as well. Um, and then we move on from there. Who else have we got? We want to quickly check out before we move on. We also have, we want to see. Who's his, oh, we've got Kim Jones' Instagram as well. Let's check out what he has to post because he has some interesting posts on his stories that I thought were quite cool to go over before we head off. Of course, number one, you've got the image of uh, Kim Jones himself and Maluma, the main man here, chilling with the actual poster or the actual front cover of him on Harper's Bazaar by Kim Jones. Maluma is looking incredible. Some nice short shorts there. Kim Jones wearing the Sakai Nikes. And of course, you've got a picture here of Jay Balvin, I'm assuming, with the dyed hair. Of course, it's Jay Balvin, another big icon. And they've got a bloody powerboat. Is that, is, that, is that the one taking the guests to the actual show? Nah, don't piss. Don't piss, piss off. He's got his people taking the guests to the show. That is amazing. Proper Miami Vice fucking feel, isn't it? Kim Jones is a boss in that regard. And you've got Kim Jones here thanking, I'm guessing, the models. Yep. Loads of skinny legs that have to be the models. So that's great to see as well. And then, of course, the show itself. The same tune playing. Thanks to everyone involved in the show tonight. Love to everybody. Wow. Amazing. Probably, I'm um, assuming Black Madonna played, right? Or was she just doing the track? That's incredible. Look at that. That's beautiful, isn't it? So cool, man. My advice feel. So I guess with your pre full shows, you can put them wherever you want, right? So I guess that's why I did it in Miami because I'm not, I'm not sure if Dior have a big presence in Miami. Or do they have... I'm not sure if they have a store out there. But the front row is very interesting. You've got Daniel Arsham there. You've got Maluma with the other model with the name. You've got Kim sitting there. Courtney. I'm not sure if it's a mask. Travis, David, Kate Moss. Uh... Oh, I forgot his name, the one that used to be a designer as well. Interesting front row there, isn't it? Lily Allen sitting there as well somewhere. Everyone's crossing their legs and being all chic and shit. Doing the damn bits. Cool, man. Great to see, innit? Pretty cool. Let's go on your story and quickly check that and then we can move on. Um, yeah, Dior invites. Everyone's thankful for the shoes. Oh, look at the tie-dye shoes. They look pretty cool, innit? Um, sort of like a... a, a Bri- oh, that's Brian Boy. Yeah, sort of like a Dior Techno. Right? Do your Nike Techno sort of vibe, of course. 
You've got here who's fitted, who's getting fitted there. I've got Sean Miss Fame, someone, I'm not sure who that is. Sean Wotherspoon was out there. Oh, Sean Wotherspoon was out there as well. Sick. He put him on a speedboat and flew them out. That's bloody incredible. I really like that. Ricky Martin, of course, had the invite. Standing there, Sean Weatherspoon's got a suit. Probably the first time Sean Weatherspoon's wore a suit in his life, isn't it? Probably, isn't it? <laughs> Ooh, this coat is looking bad. Yeah, all amazing, man. Great to see. Some real cool... What, what, what's that flag there? Dior, Miami tonight. Mr. Kim Jones first show in the United States, of course. Amazing. And like the little motif there on the tie. He got another invite. Loads of pictures of the invite. Invite, invite. Okay. This, this retweeting of people's things is similar to people retweeting their own or people retweeting compliments on Twitter is annoying, isn't it? You have to go through so many things, but it's quite cool to see the little pieces that were um, given to people at the show. Like the invites are really nice. What is it? Is it like a, is that a shoehorn? What is it? Our oh, fan. Oh, it's a fan, isn't it? Oh, that's beautiful. Wow. Me lovey, me lovey. That's great. I love that. And is that a phone case as well at the top? I don't sure. But that's really cool. You get a little fan with it. I'm not sure who Christine McCauley is, but she's flossing and doing her bits and pieces there. Everyone's creaming over the Jordans. You've got Kim giving a view of the amazing snakeskin patterns that look incredible on that habit she's wearing. Who's Miss Fame in NYC? I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. Um, you've got Honey Dee John there doing the bits as well. Bella Hadid looking stunning as per usual. David Beckham and Kim Jones. A track there. Did you play the music? Oh, sick. A track was DJing. Sick. Great to see it. Very American, that isn't it? American influence. A track and Black Madonna doing the soundtrack. Looks incredible. You've got Ali Mackie pulling up the shoes. I wonder how hard the shoes are going to get to be to get. Very difficult, right? Lily Allen there, of course. Maluma. Um, that model girl, I've got a name in. The coalition's there. Ricky Martin doing the damn thing. Oh, Ricky Martin looks great, isn't it? Yeah, Ricky Martin. Do your thing. Ricky Martin lives in Miami, though, doesn't he? I'm pretty sure. Does he live in Miami? I'm pretty sure he moved there after he got married. I'm not too sure. If don't quote me. But yeah, it was pretty amazing, man. I'm a big fan of everything involved. Big up Kim Jones. Easily one of the best designers out at the moment. He delivers season in, season out. One of the most underrated maybe designers, I'd say, in terms of actual delivery and output. And again, just bringing it, man. Who's this person with the ski mask? Uh, Skunk and Nancy. Is it? Okay. Really? Hmm. Huh. Okay. Um, again, an amazing pictures again with Kim and David. They're good friends. Who's that, YBM Namir? No, it's not, is it? Who's that? I don't know who that is. It'd be weird if YBM Namir was there, wouldn't it? Alistair McKim, of course, taking pictures there. Happy to be there. Was he the one styling? Probably, I'm not too sure. Backstage, of course, with Travis and everyone else. Paul Mitterman was out there as well, it looks like. Um, yes, Mark Fraser's tweeting some things. He was there front row as well. So, all the movers and shakers in the industry out there doing the thing and happy for his Kim walking down the, high, walking down the runway, everyone clapping and whooping, whooping, whooping. Good show from the man. But yeah, he smashed it. Fireworks, of course. Like, you look at that. How they celebrate you, man. No wonder these some of these individuals don't want to do their own namesake brand, man. These brands put this money behind you and throw fireworks at the end. Absolutely banging, man. Top man. All um, all praise to Kim Jones. This is a stellar show. Yeah, top 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 work from the dude, man. Top work, top work. So yeah, that's it, man. That's it from the Dior. And Kim Jones probably stopped wanking over that because, you know, it gets a bit cringy. But you know what? Why not? Let's do one more. One more story. Um, I think I saw a video actually uh, Playboy Carter and Luca out there too. That looked pretty interesting. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, they're out there as well, flossing with the old Dior. Of course, there's an image of it there. You can see Luca, Luca and Playboy Carter hanging out from the uh, Matthew Williams uh, Instagram. I don't know what car that is. It looks incredible though. All black, Jeep. Yeah, great to see. Oh, is that his car? Oh, is that Playboy Carter's car? What car is that? Is that a Lamborghini? Oh, is that playing under Playboy Carter? Oof. They're best friends, right? Playboy Carter and the guy. That's awesome to see, man. That's great. Great collaboration with the shoes. Okay, one side's got a deal, one side's got deal on the underneath. You got the acknowledgements. Um, so the music is A Track Styling, Melanie Ward, Casting, Shelley Durank. Uh, hat Stephen Jones, awesome to see UK stand up video tender night. Special thanks to Matthew Williams, Sean Stussy, Jordan Brand, Mera Don Rubel, Rubel Moselle, Orvel Peck, who obviously did the music. That was the one in the mask, I'm assuming. Armin van Helden and Honey Dijon. Okay, awesome, man. Wow, what a great many thanks listening. It's a put on there. 
But yeah, great to see. Check it out if you're that way inclined. I'm sure a lot of us won't be able to get anything from the collection itself. But anyway, it's nice to see from the outside looking in. It's good to kind of peek in on what the uh, higher ups are doing out there as we squallow away here in our Zara jumpers <laughs> and our five euro sunglasses we got from Madrid. Mamma mia! Okay, let's move on. Uh, da, 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 da. What else we want to talk about before I leave here? I think that might be it, you know. Yeah, because we're already one hour in. I don't want to waste too much more of your time because I've already blabbered on enough as um, enough already as it is. As per usual, the Action Zing Show episode number two six something. As per usual, if you're watching via the YouTube app, please uh, smash that like button, click subscribe, um, and make sure you tune back in for another show. If you listen via the podcast app, leave me a five star review so people can find the show. As per usual, I'm going to be DJing next. I think on the twenty first of December at the Heathcote and Star for more details else check out my website accidentalzinger.com click dj gigs all listings will be listed on there be loads of disco loads of house loads of techno loads of r&b hip-hop some good vibes so check that out if you want to check out my dj mixes get an idea of what i play check the description as well below you'll be able to see my soundcloud link which is handsome black man all soundcloud.com forward slash handsome black man all one word check that out and apart from that that but yeah in in terms of announcements i'll probably see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show but until then be safe be still and if you're crossing the road, make sure you look left and right and drink loads of water. Bye. Peace. See ya.